This is a follow-up to my video on fully auditable voting systems. Please watch that video first. This video covers an advanced topic that will be of interest only to viewers whose sole reservation about fully auditable voting systems is the trustworthiness of multipartisan auditors, but who are otherwise convinced that fully auditable voting systems are both secret and trust-free. Let's start out with some terminology so that it's clear what I'm talking about here. A fully auditable voting system is one in which it is possible to prove the result. If proving the result requires access to secret voter information, then auditors must be trustworthy individuals. An end-to-end -end auditable, or E2E, system is one in which it is possible to prove the result without access to secret voter information. Anyone can then be an auditor, including any voter. All end-to-end -end auditable voting systems are fully auditable, but not vice versa. End-to-end -end auditability generally requires more complexity than full auditability. The switchboard is a sophisticated cryptographic backend that makes Scantegrity 2 an end-to-end -end auditable system. It's pretty complicated. You probably shouldn't delve into it unless you are already completely comfortable with the operation of fully auditable systems. The version of the switchboard presented here is similar to the one used in Tacoma Park in 2009 and 2011, not the one in the 2008 paper, which is slightly different. So this one is going to be a pretty bumpy ride. You'll probably have to watch this video more than once before you understand it. Here we go. Before we get too bogged down in the details, here is an overview of how the switchboard works. For every physical ballot, there is exactly one virtual ballot. The random relationship between the physical ballots and the virtual ballots is committed using a commitment scheme before the election. The integrity of that relationship is verified by the ballot spoiled during the election. After the election, the election authority reveals the voted confirmation codes and announces the voted options of the virtual ballots. Unpredictable, verifiable information is collected after those reveals. Zero-knowledge proofs, based on that information, prove the correspondence between voted confirmation codes and voted options on virtual ballots, without revealing that correspondence. Once all of this has been done, then you can count the virtual ballots to get the results. To see how the switchboard preserves secrecy, it is necessary to understand the concept of a random permutation. If you take a deck of cards and randomly shuffle it thoroughly, then you have randomly permuted the position of every card. Each card's final position yields no information about its initial position. The correspondence between the physical ballots and the virtual ballots relies on random permutations to anonymize that correspondence. The secrecy of the switchboard backend depends on that anonymization. A virtual ballot does not correspond to an entire physical ballot except by unusual random occurrence. Instead, each virtual ballot is an amalgamation of various physical ballots. If every virtual ballot did correspond to an entire physical ballot, then a voter could be coerced on an important issue by requiring her to vote on down ballot issues in a particular way that would not likely appear in her same precinct by chance alone. This is the unique voting pattern or UVP problem. For the same reason, it is advisable to limit ranked choice voting races to about four or five candidates. The number of possible unique voting patterns for each issue should be fewer, ideally much fewer, than the number of voters in a precinct. Most often, an issue, also known as a race, consists of exactly one question. A single question might allow multiple options to be selected, for example, vote for no more than three, and options may include write-in options. With ranked choice voting, there are always multiple questions for each race, one question per rank. All of the questions within a given issue on a given ballot must remain associated with one another, or else it may affect the outcome, which would be bad. In particular, with ranked choice voting, you can't tell whether or not it's correct to count a voter's second choice unless you know what the same voter's first choice was. Therefore, shuffle the ballots once for each issue, not for each question, and not only once for the whole ballot. By the way, if you know about a real-life ballot scheme that did not fit into the framework of a set of issues, each consisting of one or more questions, each containing multiple options, then please leave a comment. 
I'd absolutely love to hear about it. The switchboard backend consists of three tables, known as the Q table, the R table, and the S table. Each Q table entry represents an option on a physical ballot with ballots in serial number order, questions in normal order, and options in a separate random order for each combination of question and a ballot to obscure the confirmation code meaning. Each entry contains the committed confirmation code for the option. After the election, the entry's confirmation code is revealed if and only if the option was voted or the ballot was spoiled. Since we no longer have multi-partisan auditors to validate the confirmation codes from challenges, the election authority will respond to a challenge by revealing all of the valid confirmation codes for the challenged question, but not without distinguishing those codes from the ones that were revealed because they were voted. If the voter's mismatching confirmation code is valid, which would happen by pure chance about 1% of the time, then we would have to involve multi-partisan representatives to oversee the paper fiber analysis of the tear-off receipt. As with the simple backend, it is important that the receipt be counterfeit resistant because otherwise the voter could mount a credible false dispute simply by guessing a valid code. Moving on to the S table. Each S table entry represents an option on a virtual ballot with ballots in a separate random order for each issue to obscure the voter's identity, questions in normal order, and options in normal order. Each entry contains a checkbox. After the election, the entry's checkbox is publicly marked by the election authority if and only if the option was voted. And this is where the magic really happens, the R table. Each entry of the R table represents a voting option. The order of the entries is completely random. Each entry contains a committed pointer to a Q table entry, a committed pointer to an S table entry, and a checkbox. After the election, the checkbox is publicly marked by the election authority if and only if the option was voted. Both pointers are revealed if and only if the ballot containing the option was spoiled. In this illustration, the grayed out items represent data that has been committed but not yet revealed. Each Q pointer and each S pointer is really just a row number, but for clarity, we represent it as a circle with a line connecting it to the corresponding row. For those keeping score at home, three commitments and two checkboxes per oval. That's roughly hundreds of commitments per ballot instead of the single commitment per ballot that we used with the simple backend. After the reveals of the confirmation codes and the marking of the checkboxes, we collect some unpredictable but verifiable data from the real world in the days that follow. For example, stock market prices and weather data. A word of caution, however, Stock volume data can take many days to finalize. This caused problems in Tacoma Park in 2009. By contrast, opening and closing prices seem pretty stable. In general, you need to confirm with the issuing authority how the data is finalized before deciding what data to use. We then compute the digest of that data to produce a pseudo-random number. One popular digest algorithm is double SHA-256, the digest algorithm used by Bitcoin. The first bit of that number determines whether to reveal either all of the Q table pointers or all of the S table pointers in the R table. The checkbox in the R table must match the checkbox in the S table or whether the confirmation code in the Q table was voted. This is an example of a simple revealed R table. In this example, the ballot has two issues with one question each. The physical ballots are B1, B2, and B3, and the virtual ballots are X1, X2, and X3. Notice that the voted options in the S table correspond to the revealed confirmation codes in the Q table, but an outside observer cannot determine that correspondence because only the S pointers are revealed in this example. The same would be true if only the Q pointers were revealed. In the S table, the options are always listed in the same order that they appear on the physical ballot, but in this example, B1's confirmation codes for Q1 appear in the Q table in reverse order, and its confirmation codes for Q2 appear in normal order because they have been randomly shuffled. The opposite situation applies to ballot B3. Here we see that the unvoted options in the S table 
correspond to unrevealed confirmation codes in the queue table. Once again, an outside observer cannot determine that correspondence because only one side of the R table is revealed. When a ballot, B2 in this example, is spoiled, the revealed data in the QRNS tables can be used to verify all of the confirmation codes. Therefore, the switchboard is still fully auditable. Also, the spoiled ballots verify that each issue on a given physical ballot lies entirely within the same virtual ballot and that every confirmation code in the Q table corresponds to the same question in the S table. In this example, both Q1 and Q2 of the spoiled ballot have their confirmation codes appear in reverse order. In this illustration, we show all of the pointers at once, which is a bit overwhelming and should give you a pretty good idea of why it's called a switchboard. Here we can verify that there are no pointer collisions, which would be proof of error. In this example, it so happens that B3 corresponds entirely to X2, but this is not something that an outside observer can determine. But now there is still a problem. If the election authority makes the checkboxes in the R table match only the Q table or the S table, then it has a 50% chance of getting away with wholesale cheating. The solution is to use many independent R tables. Spoiled ballots are fully revealed in every R table. Tacoma Park used 40 of them. Each of the first 40 bits of the pseudo-random number determines which side of an R table to reveal. Then the chance of getting away with cheating is 2 to the minus 40, which is a very small number. The R tables differ from each other in only two ways. First, the order of the entries is randomly reshuffled. And secondly, the random keys for each commitment are reassigned. In this way, the reveal of one R table does not expose any hidden information from any of the other R tables. The voted virtual ballots in the S table have now been verified to correspond to the voted physical ballots issue by issue. You can now count them as if they were the actual ballots and you are guaranteed to get exactly the same results as counting the physical ballots. One caveat, however, be careful to count ranked choice voting issues precisely according to the applicable rules. This caused a minor discrepancy in Tacoma Park in 2009. And with a traditional voting system, it caused an incorrect outcome to be certified in Alameda County in 2022. See the link in the description for details. If you understand the switchboard now, then please do me a favor and leave a comment to let me know how many times you had to watch the video before it clicked for you. You can also tweet at me at Steele's Dad. Thank you for watching and have yourself a great day.